So now we're going to take a look at electrocyclic reactions. And again, these are your ring openings or ring closures. They're totally reversible. Uh, and one thing you should know, you should be able to distinguish these from the Diels Alder and the rest of the cycloaddition. So again, your cycloaddition reactions, you have two pi systems, usually in the form of two different molecules. Uh, whereas your electrocyclics, you're always going to have a single reactant here, a single conjugated system. Uh, in this case, we're going to have the cyclic movement of pi electrons. This way, every single atom here is going to both be gaining a bond and losing a bond. That way, nobody ends up violating the octet rule. Uh, now, if you guys recall a little bit ago, we talked about having groups in and out. So I'm going to label both of these groups as being out. And then there's hydrogens here and here, that point in, uh, and things of this sort. And some of the things we talked about with Diels Alder and, and things of that sort stereochemically remain true, even though the way we describe transition states is totally different. So with only one reactant, there's no such thing as superfacial or anterofacial to even discuss. We're not having two things approach each other on the same face or opposite faces. We just have a single reactant. So those words don't even apply to electrocyclic reactions. The words we're going to use are called conrotatory and disrotatory, and we'll see where those come from. Uh, we also don't have the homo of one interacting with the lumo of the other. Other, we just have a single reactant. And so the only thing we actually have to worry about then is the highest occupied molecular orbital. That's where this reaction is going to happen. So and in this case, with six pi electrons moving in the transition state, that's going to be psi 3. And being psi 3, that's going to be symmetric. So even if you couldn't draw the entire metric, you know, molecular orbital here, as long as you knew it was symmetric, you'd know that the ends here that are important in this ring closure are going to match. So, But we're trying to form a new sigma bond right here which is going to be right here in the way I've drawn this here. That's where I want to form a new sigma bond. And what's going to have to happen is the molecular orbitals here are going to have to rotate and overlap constructively to form that new sigma bond. And we can choose to rotate them clockwise or counterclockwise. It's really up to us. Uh, but once you've done the first one, you've got to choose how you do the second one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this first one clockwise. So that's going to rotate down, and this side's going to rotate up. But if you notice, with this side rotating up, that's going to push this methyl group up as well, and he's going to be a wedge in the product. Now, if I'm rotating this blue region into the middle here, then for the orbital next to it that's going to form the other half of the bond, I also need the blue region, the, sh the blue shaded region also there, uh, end up in the middle region. That way we get constructive overlap and form a bond. So this one's going to rotate counterclockwise then. I didn't have a choice. If I'm going to get constructive overlap, it had to go counterclockwise. So if one's clockwise and one's counterclockwise, they're rotating in opposite directions, kind of like uh, a lot of windshield wipers in England, not the US. Uh, but when they rotate in opposite directions there, we call that disrotatory. So, and it turns out when you have a symmetric homo, highest occupied molecular orbital, that's when you're going to get disrotatory motion to get that constructive overlap. And so if you look here, the methyl group on the left rotates up. The one on the right also rotates up. And so on the product, they're both going to be wedges. So now we formed a six-membered ring. We're going to have pi electrons here and here, and then methyl groups in both wedged positions. Well, notice I rotated the one on the left clockwise, the one on the right counterclockwise. I could have done this one counterclockwise, which would have meant this one had to go clockwise. It still would have been disrotatory, but I would have ended up with both methyl groups pointing down. So both are possible. You get both. But in this case, this just happens to be a meso compound, so you don't have to draw it twice. Now, it turns out these can be both thermal and photochemical, the same way cycloadditions could. So, And what happens when you go to photochemical here? is that you're going to take electrons from psi 3, and you're going to promote them up to psi 4. And whereas psi 3 used to be the homo, it's not anymore. Now psi 4 is going to be the highest occupied molecular orbital. And instead of being symmetric, he's anti-symmetric. And that's going to change some things. So let's take a look here. We're again trying to form a new sigma bond right here. So and this is pi 4, or psi 4. Uh, and it's anti-symmetric. You can see the ends here don't match. And again, if you couldn't draw the entire molecular orbital, who cares? The big thing in, in terms of predicting uh, stereochemistry for the product here is do the ends match or not? If it's symmetric, they match. If it's anti-symmetric, they don't. Well, since we're anti-symmetric on psi 4, these don't match. And again, you get to choose the first one, and I'm going to choose clockwise again. 
So in, in rotating this clockwise, it's going to put the blue shaded region in the middle. So it's also going to flip the methyl group up. So to get the blue shaded region in the middle of the other one, I also need to rotate clockwise. But that's going to force this methyl group on the right down and to be a dash instead. So in this case, they're both rotating clockwise. Obviously, I could have chose them both to rotate counterclockwise, but it would have been the same in either case. And when they both go to the same direction, we call that a con-rotatory transition state. So, and in this case, that occurs when you have an anti-symmetric uh, highest occupied molecular orbital HOMO. So in this case, we can kind of see the stereochemical effect as well. Again, we're still forming a six-membered ring. This methyl group on the left here got flipped up, so that's a wedge. And this one on the right here got flipped down, so that's a dash. But again, I, I rotated them both clockwise here to get that constructive overlap. I could have rotated them both counterclockwise and had the green regions overlapping. So, and that would have given me the enantiomer here as well. So if you form something chiral, you're going to get both versions. Cool. So, and that's both the thermal conditions with the normal HOMO. So, and then your photochemical conditions where you promote electrons and what used to be the LUMO is now the new HOMO. So now we can make some generalizations with our electrocyclic reactions, again, whether that be ring opening or ring closure. So in the first thing, it turns out, we can look at the number of electrons moving in the transition state. And we identify what's called 4n plus 2. And 4n plus 2 is just a mathematical way of describing an infinite set of numbers where n is allowed to be any integer starting at 0. So if n is 0, then 4 times 0 is 0, plus 2 is 2. So 2 would be one of that infinite set of numbers. If we plug in 1, 4 times 1 is 4, plus 2 is 6. That's another member of that infinite set of numbers. And you just keep going up by 4. 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, 22, so on and so forth, all the way up to infinity. Whereas down here, 4n is just any multiple of 4. So 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, so on and so forth. Another infinite set of numbers. So it turns out if you look at the number of electrons moving, it tells you something about the HOMO. Now, if you have a 4n plus 2 number of electrons moving, that means your HOMO is going to be an odd-numbered HOMO, like psi 1, psi 3, psi 5. That also implies, therefore, it's going to be symmetric. Whereas if you've got a multiple of four electrons moving in the transition state, that means your HOMO is either psi 2, psi 4, psi 6, psi 8, uh, and is therefore going to be anti-symmetric. And as we said on the last slide here, any symmetric HOMO is going to involve disrotatory motion. So and any anti-symmetric motion is going to involve con-rotatory motion. And those are what are allowed. So if you're asked to predict products, you're being asked to predict allowed products. So, but sometimes rather than having you predict products, they give you products and just say, was it allowed or forbidden? So, and again, forbidden doesn't mean a reaction doesn't happen. It just means it's symmetry forbidden and is a, you know, would happen on a minor pathway, not a major. So keep that in mind. So in this case, if you know, you have a symmetric HOMO, then disrotatory is the allowed reaction. That's how you'd predict a product. But con-rotatory would be the forbidden route as well. Same and exactly the opposite uh, for a 4N, a multiple of four uh, electrons moving in the transition state. Now, if we change this to photochemical conditions where we promote electrons up, then what used to be the old LUMO becomes the new HOMO, and everything gets flipped on its head because, you know, instead of, you know, with your 4N plus 2, again, being... 2, 6, 10, 14 electrons. Normally, that your HOMO would be either psi 1 or psi 3 or psi 5 or something, an odd number psi. But if you promote electrons up, it'd be the next one up. And now, it becomes an even numbered molecular orbital. And those are all anti-symmetric, which now means con-rotatory is allowed and dis-rotatory is forbidden. And vice versa when you have a multiple of four. So let's kind of see how this goes into practice and stuff like that. Uh, but if you can draw the HOMO, whether it's with under thermal conditions or whether you promote electrons or do it under photochemical, you don't even have to memorize all this stuff. You can just draw the molecular orbitals or at least the very ends and see what kind of motion is required and see how that's going to stereochemically affect substituents at the end of that conjugated si uh, system. So in this last example, we're going to look at both this reaction under thermal conditions as well as photochemical additions. And notice we're being asked to predict products, and so we're going to predict the allowed products, not the forbidden ones. Uh, and in this case, we'll look at a couple things. So this methyl group here points out, whereas the methyl group at the other end of the system points in. So we can also look at the cyclic movement of electrons. We're going to make a new sigma bond right here, 
and just move electrons in a cyclic fashion. We've therefore got six electrons moving around the system. Notice that is a 4n plus 2 number. So with a 4n plus 2 number, you could already predict that thermally this is going to be dis rotatory because with six electrons that's going to be a symmetric homo highest occupied molecular orbital and so in this case we're going to form a six membered ring pi electrons still there and there so a new sigma bond right here so and we're still going to have methyl groups both here and here and what's nice is that it turns out that stereochemically, this is no different than what happened with Diels Alder, which was also a symmetry allowed uh, process under thermal conditions. And so in this case, one's out, one's in, and that would mean they end up trans to each other had this been a Diels Alder. And obviously, this is not even a cyclo addition. So, but stereochemically, it's convenient for me to remember it that way. So, however, if we can't remember it that way, and by the way, we should write plus minus as this guy's chiral, we'll get as an antimer as well. The other thing we could do is draw the molecular orbital. Let's do a little bit better job of that here. So in this case, I don't really care about anything other than the ends. I could draw the rest of the diagram, I just don't care. But the big thing is I know this is symmetric. And if it's symmetric, then the ends have to match. So and in this case, I've got a methyl group pointing in and one methyl group pointing out. And so in this case, the one on the right has the methyl group pointing in. I'm just taking this whole molecule and rotating it around counterclockwise 90 degrees. But the other one has a methyl group pointing in. So and now I'm going to turn the one on the left clockwise. Notice that's going to make this methyl group point down and be a dash. Uh, but to get constructive overlap, I'm going to have to do the other one counterclockwise, which is going to force this methyl up. So this one went clockwise, this one went counterclockwise, and again, that's disrotatory. That's what happens when you have a symmetric highest occupied molecular orbital. Uh, and in this case, we can see that again, this methyl group right here is getting forced down, whereas this one right here is getting forced up, and that's why they end up trans. So, but again, we made it clockwise and counterclockwise. I could have made this one go counterclockwise and this one clockwise, and we'd have had the enantiomer. And that's why you get both enantiomers when you form something chiral. Now for the other one here, under conditions of light, so photochemical conditions, now instead of psi 3, we're going to promote electrons up to psi 4, and he'll be the new homo. So, and whereas psi 3 is symmetric, psi 4 is anti-symmetric. And so in this case here, I can again draw the molecular orbitals, but now they're anti-symmetric, so they're not going to match. So, and again, we have a methyl group pointing in on this side and one pointing out on this side. And if I rotate this one clockwise, it puts the blue shaded region in the region where I need to make a bond. This one's going to need to rotate clockwise as well. And so, again, that's going to be con rotatory, just like we said it should be when it's anti symmetric. So in this case, both methyl groups are going to end up both going down. So they're going to end up on the same side. And we still have pi electrons there. So in this case, they're just to each other. That is a meso compound. So could they have ended up both uh, uh, wedges instead of dashes, they totally could have. Notice again, they both went clockwise. Had I had them both go counterclockwise instead, they would both been wedges, but it's a meso compound. You don't have to draw it both ways. But there's your product. And again, whether you remember any of the patterns and stuff like that, if you can draw the highest occupied molecular orbital, either under thermal or photochemical conditions, you can figure out how it's going to work out stereochemically and predict those products.